Good evening, everybody. Hi. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all for coming out tonight for this really important discussion. Um, my name is Alyssa. I am the president of the Seattle King County League of Women Voters. Some of you know me. Some of you are new faces. Welcome. Um, we do forums like this usually once a month. We bring in people from around the county who are doing really interesting and important work. Um, so if you like what you see tonight, if you want to hear more, um, we encourage you to check us out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and on our website. We post regularly about our events around the county. Um, and so it's my great pleasure to introduce our panel tonight for our discussion on juvenile justice. Um, we'll just go down the line, I suppose. Um, <laughs> I think that's easiest. So we've got Nick Straley down at the end from Columbia Legal Services. We've got Judge Judy Ramsayer from King County Superior Court. We've got Derek Wheeler Smith. I always want to say Smith Wheeler, but I know that's not right. Sorry. <laughs> um, from King County Zero Youth Detention. Yeah, um, we've got Sean Good from Choose 180. We've got, oh my gosh, <laughs> Jason Clark. I'm so sorry. We've got Jason Clark from Northwest Credible Messengers, and we've got Zach Davis from Best Starts for Kids. And our moderator this evening will be Kimberly Ambrose. She is a senior law lecturer at the University of Washington with a focus on juvenile justice. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited for this evening. Um, and we hope that this is the start of a broader conversation that we all can have. And I look forward to hearing from everybody and seeing how the league can be more involved in this really important topic. So, all right, ready? Awesome. Thank you, Alyssa and League of Women Voters. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here. And I'm so excited to see all of you folks that are interested um, and concerned about young people in our community. So that's really exciting. So um, I'm not going to go in any, I might pick on a few of you here. And these questions were not all my idea at all. So um, <laughs> bear with me. But I think we're going to get at some of the big issues uh, that we need to talk about tonight when we talk about the juvenile legal system. Um, so uh, and, and when you answer a question, maybe you can give a little bit inf more information about what it is that you do, because some people may not be familiar with with what your role is in the system. So I think that would be helpful for people as, as you answer the question. But the first thing that I want to talk about and that maybe some people are interested in as they see a very new large building going up in their community on Capitol Hill, we have a new courthouse and juvenile jail going in, and it's received a lot of media attention. So I think a lot of people are thinking about what is the purpose of locking children up in um, jail cells? And so uh, maybe I will start with the guy whose title is Zero Youth Detention. Um, Derek, uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about your title too, like what that means. I know you work for the county for a program, and then maybe you could share with us, what's the point of locking kids in jail cells? What's the purpose or goal of incarcerating kids? And why, and, and what are, you know, maybe, and what does it mean to get to zero youth detention, I guess? What's your position about? Awesome, yes. Uh, so, uh, zero youth detention uh, was a call to action by the county executive. Um, and that call to action involved pulling together many key stakeholders who came together and developed uh, what's known as the ZYD, Zero Youth Detention uh, Roadmap. And the county has been doing uh, some great work over the last 20 years, uh, actually to reduce uh, the containment and confinement uh, of young people uh, being incarcerated. Um, but what we understand, while the numbers have declined in terms of the young people who are in juvenile detention, disproportionality um, has continued to rise um, in terms of our black and brown children, most recently even going up another 6%. And so we've got a ton of work to do, uh, which is why one of those strategies ultimately is to lead uh, with racial equity. Are you able to hear me well? Okay, great. I didn't know. I saw somebody kind of doing that, and I like to say, oh, I don't need a mic, and I remember being a young panelist and somebody saying, oh, the mic's not for you, sir, and I'm like, uh, <laughs> I'll keep that in mind moving forward. Um, and so 
the idea, uh, of course, is what does it look like uh, for us to get to zero youth detention? And how do we move away from the punitive approach, punitive system, and the punitive measures that we have um, that lead us, I think, ultimately to this place of the question that I think uh, Kim asked around, what is the point of locking uh, young people in cells? Um, I think, I, I'm not sure what the, I think the point for, or the idea or concept behind it is, it centers ultimately around uh, this notion and idea of how do we get to a place of public safety where people are taken out of a space where they can't harm themselves or the community. But I think what's clear is, uh, and what the data shows us, is that there has been no benefit ultimately to young people who are being locked up and who are being uh, incarcerated. As a matter of fact, I think it's 37 times more likely that once a young person has touched the juvenile detention system, that that young person is going to end up being uh, incarcerated or sent to prison later. And so we know that it has not been a rehabilitative process. We have tons of data uh, that shows that, that proves that, and has made that ultimately clear. And so I think what we're hoping to do is to create uh, diversion opportunities where we don't have to have young people locked up. And how do we change a mental model that moves us away from this idea that somehow the correction for antisocial behavior is punishment? I believe that the correction for antisocial behavior is love and remembrance of identity, and that that does not have to happen outside of helping young people to grow um, and to learn and to move forward in ways that are accountable and responsible. But isn't there any place, is there any place for incarcerating, any reason, or is there a place in this system for incarceration? Do children need to be locked up? Do children need to be <laughs> Are locked there up? any children that need to be locked up? What's the role? Is there any role? If you're if you're working for zero youth detention, maybe you're telling me there's no role for, yeah, for I, incarceration. I think, I think ultimately, you know, I think there are people who would, you know, want to tilt to that side of the conversation and scale. And I would say that those few cases, I think, are end up being so small and minute in terms of the big order and scheme of things. Um, and I think that those are case by case scenarios that we have to look at and explore um, and figure out what's in the best interest uh, of helping to restore that young person, heal that, while at the same time helping to restore and heal the community. And so uh, I think it's really about how do we focus on the larger number of what we're seeing in terms of uh, the mass numbers of black and brown bodies in particular are young people who are literally being pushed. Uh, into a system. And do you know the number right now? Is it 80% or what's the percentage of kids that are currently in our King County Detention Facility that are black or brown? I think it is. I, I, you know what? I don't have the exact numbers and so because of that I don't want okay. to, to I say. mean I've looked at the data a lot and it usually seems to range somewhere between 60 and 85%. Absolutely that, it that, does. Um, that's, that's accurate. Current. Yeah current. So about 85% of the young people. Um, uh, well, I'll go to Nick. Nick, I know that you were um, involved somewhat in uh, uh, the No New Youth Jail movement, right, with Columbia Legal Services, and that you supported the community activists that were objecting to incarcerating children and building a new jail. So can you talk about what you think the role of incarceration is in this juvenile punishment system? Sure, yeah. So I'm an attorney with uh, Columbia Legal Services, and we were involved in the No New Youth Jail movement in the Southside Jail Station. Yeah, my dad. Sorry, you don't, you don't, you don't got the booming voice. For yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm an attorney with Columbia Legal Services, and we were involved in some of the litigation that arose out of the uh, fight over the youth jail. Um, and I, I do believe that we can get to a place where we don't, in, quote, unquote, incarcerate children. Um, we can, if we have the will and the willingness to spend the money, come up with a series of options, a series of programs, a series of housing situations that, result, that provide the appropriate services for an appropriate kid who's in an appropriate situation. Unfortunately, um, we haven't decided to do that. Um, unfortunately, I think we suffered, and I will say suffered because I think we're moving in the right direction now, but I think 10 years ago, we suffered from a lack of imagination. And we chose to spend $232 million on a jail. What, is that, what could that $232 million have done for us? It could have funded Sean's organization for 240 years. <laughs> okay? Amen. We, we made that choice as a people. We can make different choices of how we prioritize the resources that we have. 
And just to put this in a little context, so you may hear that it does that the, the amount we spend on education makes no difference, right? You hear that from people that it, it's not about resources. The, until this year, King County or Seattle spent about fifteen thousand dollars a year per kid. If you send your kid to Lakeside, they'll charge you thirty-six thousand dollars a year. There is no social service in this state that rivals that, except one, and that's the Department of Corrections. We spend about $35,000 a year to lock every single person up in this state. We could make different choices. We could prioritize in different ways. And if we want to solve that, this problem, that's what we have to do. And it starts with the policymakers. We all have to make the decision and the commitment to actually alter the system, or we're going to continue to have the same result that we've had today. So, Judge, uh, uh, I'll let you respond because, as, as the judge at juvenile court, I imagine you're sending young people to jail cells, right? And so, maybe you could talk a little bit about what children are those that are appearing before you that uh, that you believe uh, warrant being in locked up and, and are there other alternatives? Well, I appreciate the opportunity and I, I am the chief judge over at the King County Juvenile Court and I, and I just by way of a little background, the juvenile court has jurisdiction over both criminal matters and civil matters. So we deal with juvenile offenders. We also deal with dependent youth, at-risk youth, truant youth. All of those matters come under the auspices of the juvenile court. So dependent um, youth being those youth that are being taken from their parents and placed into foster care? They're not all taken from their parents, but yes, where the state is pursuing uh, allegations of neglect or abuse and is trying to provide services to the family. That sometimes requires separating the family. It does it 100% of the time. And it can lead ultimately to termination of parental rights. So it's a very serious matter. I just want to clarify the record a little bit about the building on 12th and Alder. It, it is a justice center. It is not exclusively a jail. A jail. There is a juvenile detention center in the building. There absolutely is. King County, along with other counties in the state, are required to have a juvenile detention center. It also contains 10 courtrooms. It contains, uh, with, with space for people to come to court, which we don't currently have in our facility. There are lots of training and conference and meeting rooms that are going to be available to the public to reserve after work hours. There are confidential spaces for families and attorneys and victims and witnesses to speak confidentially with people. There's a resource center, which is kind of a centerpiece of a lot of the reforms that we're trying to institute in juvenile court. Uh, there are many amenities. There's a, a child care center that we currently don't have. And in juvenile matters, parents are required to come. So they're often bringing siblings and younger kids in tow. So that building contains all of those things. And it isn't simply a youth jail. I want to make that clear. That's how it's been characterized. I absolutely agree that we need to continue to move toward not incarcerating young people. And the thrust of uh, our interventions when a, when a young person comes to our system needs to be how can we help this person and his or her family grow, gain skills, get better connected with resources in their community so that as they deal with challenges, they're doing it in ways that are going to lead them more successfully to where they want to go. I'm required, and I don't want to get overly legalistic about this, but there are statutes that govern, you know, when charges are brought, when kids commit crimes, when the prosecutor files charges against them, and as far as the initial determination of whether a youth is held in detention or not depends on safety to the community, and, and risk of failure to appear at their next court hearing. Those are the two factors the judge takes into consideration. In the detention center, kids are not serving sentences. All of that is pretrial. So it's all awaiting how we're going to resolve whatever the matter is that brought them to court. 
Uh, that doesn't mean they might not be sentenced, as you say, to uh, incarceration in another facility operated by the state. But those numbers have continued to, to decline very dramatically, as uh, Mr. Wheeler Smith said, over the last 20 years. And now the average daily population in the juvenile detention center today is around 35 kids. And it's a very short period of time that they're there. Can we improve on that? Absolutely, absolutely. And I support the movement toward zero youth detention and we're continuing to work with the people on this panel and, and many others to get there. So um, Derek, both Derek and Nick mentioned that you know, imagination and thinking about alternatives to detention, right? And so Sean, can you talk a little bit about 180 and what you see as the value of uh, 180 in preventing incarceration and how you're working with the system or outside of the system or sure. how is it that you work? Sure, thank you. Um, first, a brief story. I was in Atlanta with my son. I was showing him Morehouse College. I really want him to go there really bad. Um, I hope he makes that decision. I digress. But he got a nosebleed uh, while he was there, a really bad nosebleed that wouldn't stop. And so I'm a dad in Atlanta with my son. I usually think drinking water and sleep is the solution to everything. But in this case, drinking water and rest was not helping his nosebleed. So we look for an emergency room because my son's having this critical moment, I need to find some place to take him to get some advice on what it is I should do to best meet his need. And ultimately we find an urgent care place. The woman says, look, you know, his blood pressure is fine. He'll be okay, you know, pinch it, keep his nose tilted up and you see if he keeps bleeding in the morning, come back and see us. It was incredibly fortuitous that there was some place open at that hour for me to be able to take my son to get the advice that we needed for me to feel secure, to know that he'd be healthy enough to make it to the morning. And really, that's what our young people need. They need spaces that are open and available for them when they have these critical moments of behavior that often get criminalized by law enforcement, that in lieu of incarceration can consult with somebody who's a functional expert, help the family understand how to be able to mediate whatever's happening, and create an atmosphere where the young person is safe and secure enough outside of state supervision in order for them to be able to live healthy and strong and, 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 and prosperous in the community that they're in. Um, if we apply a public health lens to the work of juvenile justice, it all makes sense. At the core, we're dealing with young people with behavioral issues, and the behavior only gets criminalized when law enforcement gets involved. And for black and brown kids, law enforcement gets involved way more often than it does for white kids. And because law enforcement gets involved with behavioral issues, then it's a crime, and then it goes to the prosecutor's office. Then the prosecutor gets to look at what the law enforcement officer has dictated as a crime and then sends it to the court and the court gets to determine if the young person's a risk. Now let us not be deceived that the numbers of young people who are actually inside have decreased, but there's still a large number of young people who are on electronic home monitoring, and there's a large number of young people who are on probation or, 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 or in observation. And so where they're not young people who are living free of a system of injustice that's doing them more harm than good more often than not. And so it behooves us to be innovative in our approach and consider what's possible instead of considering what's problematic. That's a very long introduction to our work, but I think it sets the table appropriately that by simply mitigating young people behavior, by criminalizing it based upon the perception of threat, only allows our implicit bias to take over and make judgment calls on the lives of young people that set them on a trajectory to end up further institutionalized in the future. That's a whole lot of words to say it just doesn't work well. Our organization began in 2011 in partnership with the King County Prosecuting Attorney's Office because Dan Satterberg said, this just doesn't work well. And what we're doing for our black and brown youth is failing them over and over and over again. So we connected with the community leader, Doug Wheeler, and, 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 and with Doug and Dan and a variety of other folks like Dominique Davis and other leaders in the community, they created the 180 program, which now lives as Choose 180 today where we divert young people away from the criminal justice system, and 80% of the young people we engage don't return within 12 months. You heard Derek's data about young people when they touch the system, how frequently they return. It's because young people who engage our programming have an opportunity to be rooted and grounded in the fact that they're not a problem that needs to be solved, but a possibility that needs to be developed, that they need community instead of convictions. It's not rocket science. It's what every one of us fundamentally needs, an opportunity to be seen, an opportunity to be heard, an opportunity to hurt, had that hurt met with appropriate services, 
and then an opportunity to be supported in committing to a new direction. Our work works because we treat the person as an individual and not as a problem, a part of a bigger system. So you're talking about your success at 80%, you said, or? Yeah, and, and I mean, if we get into the numbers of young adults, it's even crazier than that. So why don't we just divert everything? Yeah, I, I actually think that's a really great question. Um, I think the challenge comes when we, one of the things we have to ask the question of, which is really important, is what do, what do we do for the people who have been harmed and the community that's been harmed? Um, I, we I regularly talk about, um, well, we're doing all of this for the accused. What about the people who have been impacted by the accused? And that's a very important conversation to have. I've been doing this work for quite some time and have talked to many of people who have been harmed by people who have had behavioral issues that have been criminalized. And you know what they tell me? They say they want to be made whole and they want to make sure the person that did the thing doesn't do it again. Well, incarcerating young people almost assures that they're going to do something again, so we're not honoring them there. And restitution is very rarely paid because the people who will have to pay the restitution don't have the resources to do so, so we're not honoring them there. So really what we're doing is we've created a system that only makes the people outside that aren't impacted feel safe and secure, but those that are implicated in it are the ones that are suffering the most. So how are we serving victims now appropriately? Are we really honoring their needs? Are we doing what's best for them? Or are we doing what's best for us to feel like enough is being done so we can sleep well at night? I see people on a daily basis who have been victims of crime who are still waiting to be made whole. And our criminal justice system is ill-equipped to do that. But you know what is well-equipped? Community. Because what happens in community can be resolved in community. And if resolved in community, it doesn't need to be escalated to the courts. We see it happen all the time in certain communities of folks where it never gets criminalized. Young person steals something at a school that's more affluent, the parents work it out in community. Young person steals something at a school where there's a resource officer, that behavior is criminalized and it's sent into juvenile court. Yeah. Um, well, that kind of makes me turn to you, Jason. I think you're uh, working in communities, right? And you're also working, I believe, with folks that uh, are committing some more serious harms, right? if you're working with folks that are, do you think that uh, we could divert everything? What would that take? Diffusion of innovation. <laughs> um, I, I agree with Sean. I think, you know, that's one of the things that could happen, but I truly think that the... Oh, and could you talk to you a little bit about Credible Messengers too, just to introduce that? Oh, so introduction, I'm Jason Clark. Um, I manage a program and consult uh, uh, organization called Northwest Credible Messenger. That specifically is focused on supporting those who have been most impacted by systems with professional development, capacity building, technical assistance, and just really tapping into their vision and dreams to be able to support young people who are going through the same things, coming into contact with systems, uh, being ostracized from their education and school systems, or just facing adversity in community and don't have resources. So credible messengers are people who have overcome systemic contacts um, with integrity and transformation. Obviously understand how to mentor young people are susceptible to mentorship themselves uh, in professional development. So they are, are kind of that beacon of hope for young people who do come into contact with systems um, and just providing those services that Sean talked about. You know, that person who's gonna pick up the phone when you get that emergency call at two o'clock in the morning because something happened. Uh, or that person who's gonna be there when you know you don't know how to navigate a system so they can be connected and have that support from somebody who successfully navigated that system. Um, and I say that to say, like, I do believe that, um, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of evidence that's being generated behind the credible messenger approach. And I say, I say this to say, like, one of the things that we often rely on within systems are evidence-based practices. And I think we have to trust more of our community in evidence-generating practices. Um, to the question of could we divert everything, I, I believe that's a possibility. I, do, I, I truly believe that's a possibility. Um, but for us to get there, I, I think it consists of the village getting stronger, right? Like I think at one point we see, you know, working in systems, these effective models that might be engaging in community and then we pour all the resources into that one leader, that one mentor, that one program or that one manager. And I don't think that's, that's the, the solution to this. Um, I definitely think that, you know, if we, if we think of innovation and supporting other ideas and, you know, shifting some of the resources, we talked about a, a $232 million, was that Nick? $232 million? That could fund Sean's program for 240 years. <laughs> right? What, 
what, what, yeah, please. What, well, I just think like, what could we have done if there would have been a $113 million building, right? Um, so I think the diffusion of innovation, thinking outside the box, I know from working with people within the court, um, one of the most impactful things is, you know, you, you, you forecast how to creatively engage community and create these resources for young people. Well, we didn't build line items in for community resources, right? So I think the investment in community and creating those diversion opportunities is an investment. You can't bank on outcomes without income, right? So I think at the end of the day, our community leaders are, you know, the ones who are kind of the firefighters running into the building to support, you know, the, the, the kitty cats and the, the grandmas and, you know, the, the children in our community. And I think that to get to that point where we do start to divert those things, we have to creatively think about what those resources look like. Um, and maybe that's, you know, creating a panel to talk about some budget shifts. It, Judge Ramsire talked about the way that the law works. I think that we have to start, you know, thinking about policies instead of programs because programs are Band-Aid fixes. You know, Derek said something really crafty outside earlier about, you know, um, people in systems fixing, you know, people in our communities and they go to the community and wipe their nose and think everything's fixed because the snot is gone. But at the end of the day, you know, this person has a pneumonia and they might be dying. Um, well, the resource issue seems like a good segue into what you do, Zach, in terms of trying to invest resources and in things that work. So um, can you talk a little bit about Best Starts for Kids and your role in that? And um, maybe if you could give us some examples where community investment is working. Yeah, so my name is Zach Davis. Thank you so much for having me this evening. And the mic is <laughs> it's telling me to hold it. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Um, I'm going to need you to repeat some of those questions, but I will <laughs> just briefly. So are folks familiar with Best Starts for Kids? No. So it's a levy, tax levy funded initiative, a King County tax levy, levy funded initiative. Uh, and it's focused on folks from prenatal to 24 and their families and communities. So um, I'll get more specific with the investment area that I oversee, which is stopping the school to prison pipeline. And is that a term that folks are familiar with? Okay with that one? Okay. So in terms of this specific investment area within a very large initiative that funds approximately $65 million a year into the community, uh, a lot of our focus is on prevention, promotion, early intervention. And uh, specifically Stop the School to Prison Pipeline is focused on 12 to 24, looking at um, youth and young adults and their families and how we can... Um, support the programs in community-based organizations and efforts in the community that are serving those 1224 who particularly are at high risk or are currently involved in the criminal legal system and other harmful systems. So um, I, I, I kind of, I could go on and on, but. Yeah, so um, this gets to that resource issue a little bit. You don't have all the money in the world, but you have $65 million. So could you talk a little bit about uh, where you've been investing it in something that works, something that's community-based and, and does seem to address some of these issues, like the issue that Sean already brought up about the SROs and the schools that are sending kids to the detention instead of yeah. more positive. Yeah, so the investment area that I oversee is approximately four and a half million a year. So oh, 65 was for the whole best starts. Excuse whole, me. Yeah, I like, wish dang, I had. I thought that was just your part. I, 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 like, I so life? wish. And, and if, and if, uh, okay. if King County residents are fine with increasing <laughs> taxes to pay for that, I'd be more than happy to put it to good use. But, um, but that being said, in terms of the investments we're making in the community, a lot of them are, uh, focused on, um, organizations that are working with youth who are at high risk, and we know that for the most part, that's a lot of youth who are black and brown, right? And it's not just um, those who are involved in the criminal legal system, it's those who are at high risk. So it's best starts for kids, not best aftermath for kids. It's not best, okay, what do we do now for kids? It's not best reaction for kids. It's best starts for kids. So a lot of our focus is, again, that promotion, prevention, early intervention. And in terms of programs that we're doing, well, they range. And so, you know, I could talk about a number of organizations, ones that you may not be familiar with, but I can tell you what the nature of the work is um, and where we serve. A lot of it's focused in South King County because we know a lot of the numbers indicate that in terms of those who are involved in the criminal legal system or at high risk, 
And thanks to gentrification, a lot of black and brown youth are being, and their families are being displaced and pushed further and further into South King County, right? So therefore, a lot of our investments are focused on an area, but not exclusively. So I wanna make that very clear. And the programs are everything from, you know, you have your basic mentoring, but then you also have some very dynamic programming that's focused on um, culturally reflective curriculum. So that's something that I think is worth noting that we're so, a lot of times, and understandably so focused on what's happening to these kids in terms of the criminal legal system. Um, and I think a lot of us can probably um, shout out a number of stats for how many kids, you know, black and brown youth that are um, arrested, what the percentages are, so on and so forth, but how well versed are we in graduate, graduation rates, in college rates? How well versed are we in terms of identifying how we as a system has set it up for these kids to success or to fail? It's called the school to prison pipeline for a reason, and that is not because these kids um, are the problems because we as a system have to take responsibility for how it is that we are ushering children into a, a path of um, uh, destruction, and imprisonment, so on and so forth. A lot of our focus for Best Arts for Kids is trying to prevent these kids from ever even having contact with the criminal legal system, period. They're not having these encounters. It's not, and, and, and not only that, it's where, where do we want our children to go? If we're so focused and we're defining success as, well, my kid, my kid didn't go to jail, then we have a very poor definition of success. It's also about what is it that we hunger for? What is it that we so deeply desire for our children, uh, youth and young adults, and their families to experience? And how do they define success? Not how we define it for them. So a lot of the focus for stopping the school to prison pipeline is not just looking at how we can provide services for those who are quote unquote being touched by the criminal legal system and whatever that means, but also those who um, early on, what kind of curriculum are we providing in the classroom that really speaks to the hearts of these children? How are we providing them with relationships and guidance and resources so that um, this whole discussion isn't something that doesn't even come across their path? Does that make sense? So then we're looking at not only stopping the school to prison pipeline, the school to life success pathways. Yeah, so again, sorry to push on you on this, but can you give okay. an example maybe of a program that you're funding that's working or that's Yeah, something? so one that I think a lot of people are familiar with, particularly in Seattle, is community passageways. Um, and so- They don't think these folks are familiar, so why don't you tell us a little bit? <laughs> well, I'm not, I'm, I'm not gonna be well versed in, in everything that they do, but I, will know, I do know that they do a considerable amount of um, relationship with youth and young adults who in a lot of cases are involved in a criminal legal system and are needing support in terms of navigating the legal system, advocacy in order to try to prevent them from ending up in prison in the first place. And then there's the simple things as to who can they turn to when they're experiencing a crisis in their life? Who can they turn to when they're trying to find a job? Who can they turn to when they need something as simple as transportation? Because public transportation is not always an option for some youth, particularly when navigating areas where it may not be safe for them to travel. So in terms of community passageways, and I hope I'm doing them justice, but they're one of many, and you know, Choose 180, you know, Credible Messengers. These, all these programs are doing amazing things in our community to help these kids in very real ways. And it's more than just, you know, you throw a number at them and say, here's a resource. It's the relationship. And I can't emphasize that enough. Yes, we can program something all day long, but how are we building relationship with these youth? They don't care what we know until they know that we care. So how are we building relationship with them? And I think it's incredibly powerful that it's um, adults, it's people in their life who have those shared and parallel experiences, who look like them, who come from their communities and can speak to what they're going through. So, Sean, I know you want to say something about this issue of schools and. Well, I, I want to talk a little bit about the dollar thing because so often we talk about, well, like Best Starts is great because there's dollars allocated for this, right? One of the challenges that I have is we have a roadmap to get to zero youth detention, but we're still investing in things that lead young people to being detained, right? So it's, it's problematic. Here's an example. Uh, my wife and I have Weight Watchers memberships, right? So we go to these meetings, we sit in a circle, I put on the name tag, I step on the scale, I'm shamed, right? This happens weekly. Um, um, 
It's also eggnog season, right? Like this is really problematic. Weight Watchers and eggnog do not go together really well. So if I buy eggnog and I'm paying for a Weight Watchers membership, I'm probably wasting money one side or the other. I'm either really about losing weight, then I probably shouldn't be spending money on eggnog, or I better just go ahead and enjoy this eggnog and not worry about the pounds. But you can't have both. And what we have in our county is an argument for both. You can't have both zero youth detained and fund practices that detain youth. At one end or another, you have to begin to divest from the archaic practice of incarceration and invest in alternatives. But until you pull money away from some of those archaic practices and invest in innovative approaches, you're still going to have both eggnog and a Weight Watchers membership and wonder why you're fat. I know I do. So I would suggest, I know I'm working on it, okay? I'm working on it. I got, it, it well, thank you. But, but when I look in the mirror, I feel a particular kind of way, okay? And my set, right, I know, right? But we can't resolve that today, all right? It's late. I need a little, I, I need a little bit of therapy. Leave my eggnog alone. No. <laughs> the point being is that we have to be intelligent about the way we're resourcing things. And if we really want to get to zero, then we need to stop investing in things that are leading to numbers. Because if you pull the dollars away from the courts and you say we're going to slowly reduce the budget of the courts, that means we have to slowly increase the budget of alternatives, which means we can't rely on the courts to be the answer because they don't have the resources to be the answer, which means we have to rely on innovative practices to be the answer because that's where the dollars are going. We have to pull the money away from school resource officers because they don't actually make the school safer. They just make people who have kids in the school feel like the school's safer, and that's why they're in the position that they're in but we pull the money from school resource officers and invest in alternatives that actually create opportunities for young people to feel safely engaged by people that reflect the communities that they're from. This is the League of Women Voters. We have to tell our council members, this is what the budget needs to look like. We need to tell our King County council members, if we are really going to promote an idea of getting to zero, then we also need to begin to divest from the things that are leading to numbers. It just makes common sense but it requires your voice to be elevated to do so because an absence of a cacophony of noise that disrupts status quo in a way that they begin to hear the harmonious sound of us saying no more young people incarcerated, then we're gonna to continue to fund the courts and fund community programs and wonder why we're still in the same sandbox building the same castles. We have to stop playing this game and commit to a new way of eradicating systems of injustice and building up alternatives together that sustain more than just a movement, but become a, a long-term practice for all of our community. Um, I think Judge Brantier wants to respond there, and then I'll go. I would like to. Uh, you know, I agree with what uh, everyone has said, that the solutions lie in the earlier we can intervene in the lives of people that are showing difficulty or running into trouble in their communities, the better the more we can uh, build relationships with them in their local communities and have resources there locally, the better. It has to be individualized around that either youth who's getting in trouble or the young person's family. There aren't one size fit all solutions to complex human pro problems. I agree with all that. And the court partners with everyone on this panel to provide money, resources, to work on innovation. Uh, we want to drive the solutions and the programs more deeply into the community because we absolutely agree with what's been said that that ultimately is going to be both more effective and more long-term. You know, the court is a short-term solution in kids' lives. We're not gonna be there, but the community can and should be there, and so we are investing in the community. So I just wanna make the point that, I, you know, I get a little defensive, I'll admit, when it appears that the court is not on board with these reforms or is doing nothing to support these reforms because we absolutely agree with it and have been part of the you know, the, the front lines of these innovations for many years and want to continue doing yes. that. Part of the issue with getting programs in the community is that it's hard to go from nothing to all and there's a bandwidth issue. Yes. And so, like community passageways or, or credible messengers, we, we 
have kids in all of those programs. So Jen, I do want to ask you though to respond maybe to this resource shift because uh -huh. I think what Sean said, if I heard him correctly, and what some folks are saying is that there will require a divestment, an actual shifting yeah. of resources. So that means is the court willing to give up courtrooms and give up judges and instead move those resources, those very expensive resources, into communities. And, 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 and Kim, just, I, and, and Judy, you know how much I appreciate you, right? So we do this all the time. <laughs> um, but furthermore, one of the things, in, and semantically what you're saying, and it's true, is that the court gives resources too, right? That's problematic in, its, in the first place, right? The court shouldn't have the resources in the first place. They should be in the community, so we're not going to the court asking for it. Right. So what I'm suggesting is like those resources be removed altogether so it doesn't need to be allocated to us from the court. It's already ours. So the court can come to us for help instead of us coming to the court. It changes the power dynamic. It doesn't matter how many panels that community organizers get to sit on and have positional power and influence if the dollars still live within the system and the system's dictating who gets to have access to those dollars. Yes, we're being innovative and collaborative with one another. But as we sit in this building right now, if I began to break some of those windows, some of y'all might look at me crazy. But if I began to knock out these pillars that are supporting this space, we might start having a different conversation because all of us in this room are dependent on this room being held up by those pillars. But if we begin to create something outside of here together, collaboratively, and I start knocking down one pillar at a time as we're adding pillars outside, then we feel secure because we know we're moving someplace together that's outside of this space. And what I'm suggesting is it's impossible for us to authentically co-labor as long as I continue to come to this space looking for resources to build something out there because this space is going to continue to say, well, we already have this room. What do we need to build something out there for? It's going to be very difficult for the people that depend on this room to knock down the pillars and envision space outside if, if we're not co-laboring and doing it together. But if we're going to authentically co-labor, the resource shift has to be present. And is there some openness in the court for that type of resource shift, Judge? And I and I don't want to put this all on you. I know that that's not your, you know, necessarily your job. But from from where you sit, do you see a movement at all? I, I think there is a, a commitment to continuing to shift the solutions more deeply into the community. The reality, however, is that the state court system is constitutionally convened, and it's not going to go away. I mean, you're not going to dissolve the court without a constitutional amendment. The building, the new Children and uh, Family Justice Center belongs to the county. It doesn't belong to the court. It's a county building. So there are nuances. It's not something I can decide. There are many layers and many people involved. But I think absolutely that in order to create organic and responsive and localized resources, and I, I get a little frustrated with reference to the community because I don't even know for sure what that is because there are so many communities within our community. And I think the more localized the resources around the unique attributes of a community, um, the, the better the services are gonna be because the people understand the needs of their neighbors. And so I, absolutely, I think there is that, uh, that interest in doing that. It's not as simple as just saying, okay, Sean, here's my money. I don't control the money. I don't have the purse strings. Somebody else tells me what my budget is. Um, I mean, I personally feel like the courts are the wrong place to be addressing these issues. The courts are where we traditionally have addressed these issues. But if you were really running a just system, you would get the courts out of the situation and you would have community-based supports that kids were dealing with on a daily level. The courts would not be making decisions in this regard. In addition, I, I, and with all due respect, Your Honor, it, systems will not give up resources until they're forced. The reason there's zero youth detention in King County is because young people, brown and black young people, sat in the streets and made it difficult for Dow Constantine. That's why that commitment was made. The reason we don't have a 200 bed jail and we're only going for a 125 bed jail is because black and brown kids sat in the streets and forced the county to, to reduce the numbers. And people, I'm sorry, but people get cynical. And it's things like this. If you look on this sheet, it says 
November 2017 executive order calling for public health approach to juvenile detention and moving youth charged as adults from adult facility to youth services center. Ostensibly, that's what the county did, right? So they want to take credit for that. The backstory is we sued them. They did that only because we sued them. And now they want to take credit for it. People get cynical for reason. And it's only if people keep pushing. And it's not just brown and black kids. It's people that look like me need to be out there pushing. Brown and black kids have enough to worry about. It's the rest of us time to step up and do some work. If we want a truly just system, we need to demand a truly just system. And we can do it. It's just a matter of will and, and willingness to be there and, and support the people that have been on the streets fighting in this battle for a long, a long time. I think that uh, Nick and uh, Sean hit, hit on interesting points. And I think this is deeply centered and rooted, honestly, in a conversation about, about power. Right. And an opportunity that we have really to create uh, belonging. I mean, we're talking about a historical context of a constitution when it said we the people was talking about free land owning white males. And all of these institutions that we have are built to preserve that reality. Um, and so we're literally talking about having to dismantle ultimately these structures that have been put in place and without really talking about how we're going to shift these power structures and these dynamics. We're going to continue to watch the same things at play. I mean, you mentioned, uh, you know, this idea of getting into schools. We have a local district that suspended 40 kindergartners. Mm. What does a kindergartner do to have to be suspended, right? Like, I got, I got a kindergartner and a first grader. And I can't imagine my wife and I telling my son after he does something bad, hey, Judah, you're out the house for three days. But in three days, you can come back, and mommy and daddy, we're going to love you, and we're going to support you. But if you do something bad, then we're going to kick you out again. Um, and so these are, are, are what we're, and, and even to go back further than that, when we think about black women and mortality rates um, and babies, so this, this is starting well before school, and that's deeply connected to who we the people are ultimately in this country. And when we talk about how resources have been allocated or resources that have not even been given on the backs of people who ultimately built, right, the foundation of this country, and I'm, I'm speaking more specifically around the fact of even when we think about how our schools are ultimately funded, how are schools funded? Through tax dollars. Well, people who are poor didn't trip and fall into poor neighborhoods. Ghettos are a social construct of our government, right? And so if ghettos are a social construct of our government and schools are funded by these taxes, people didn't just fall into these communities. These are real challenges. And now we know that a young person's mortality rate is actually, their zip code is a larger predictor of their mortality rate than their DNA. So we've got work to do, right? And yet we still want to reference it and call it the American dream. Maybe we're calling it the American dream because you have to be asleep to believe it. And so we've got to go back and talk about some of these things like the Juvenile Justice Act and some of these institutional practices and policies and things that are in play that are perpetuating the very things ultimately that we're saying that we want to dismantle. And you're right, no true change is going to come from the top down. It never has and it never will, right? And so it requires, right, that the people come to the table and that the people raise their voices and that we demand uh, that these changes happen. Um, thanks, Derek, but you took a job at the top. <laughs> So can you talk maybe a little bit about your vision and maybe why you did that and what, what, what uh, Nick down there is cynical. Um, <laughs> I think you did say cynical. Um, Derek, are you cynical or, I mean, how are you viewing um, your work ahead? I know you've only been at this work for four months now, so I'm not going to hold you to anything. Yeah. But, but, but why are you staying in it? W what do you find hopeful? I think ultimately I'm staying in it. Uh, in part because, um, you know, I think without having a sense of hope, hopelessness is the enemy of justice. And so there's a demand on me to have to remain hopeless as we just recently recognized on August 19th as I stood on the shores of Fort Monroe where the first African slaves touched this land 
over 400 years ago, um, and I think about what has transpired over that last 400 years, and we haven't come very far. And so if there's anybody that can be cynical, I think on this panel, ultimately, you know, I'm one of the folks that I feel like can, can really sit in that space because of what I've had to endure to get to this point. And so um, when I think about the work that I've done over the years, I mean, even back in the early 90s, Kim and I were laughing about what recidivism or what uh, diversion worked <laughs> looked like back then versus where we're at today and the amount of work that has had to happen to get to this point. But ultimately, from somebody who's come from the community, from somebody who, who's been in the streets and who's been on the block to being able to move into the space that I'm in now, that's not something that I take lightly. And honestly, it's a difficult challenge because ultimately there is a ton of skepticism from my community uh, about the institution. And that makes a lot of sense, right, to me. And so honestly, I'm choosing a, a path that can be challenging ultimately because when you decide to work for the institution, I'm not gonna be institution enough for the institution because I'm working to dismantle racism. But I'm also not gonna be community enough for the community because I work for the institution. And so there are challenges I know that comes with that, but I got exhausted with being and working in the community and seeing young children who I would, who I would equate to this idea of watching them be thrown in the river. And then having to jump in that river exhaustingly time after time and save kids out of that river. And eventually you reach a point where you're out of breath and you can't jump in that river. And so you say to hell with this, I wanna go upstream and see who's dumping kids in the river. And so that's what the commitment is for me to show up and to be that voice at the table to create accountability. And so there might be a definition of what zero youth detention looks like. But what that ultimately means for me is a commitment to understand that there's something about that that is inherently racist. Even the idea of zero youth detention, the fact that we have to do something to stop these black and brown children who are already on their way to jail. Our true work is really figuring out how do we create thriving, healthy, safe communities that ensures that our young people are set up to live life in ways that are healthy and well that then leads to zero youth detention. Okay, thanks. I think there might be some questions from the audience, but before we get there, Jason, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, I just think, you know, this is a really healthy topic. We talked about change and we talked about, you know, shift in resources. And I can tell you, um, being that kid who was in juvenile, who was in jail, who was in prison, who also maintained a high level project management position for the same court that sent him to prison, King County Superior Court. Um, I don't know if that change is something that's possible unless people start to think of what it looks like to remove those pillars, right? Sean talked about the pillars. We talked about, you know, this public health approach and how this is the, the amazing transition, but Nick pointed out that this was forced. When I look at the public health approach, I'm looking at science basis and trauma informed, and the reality is science is saying that a lot of the resources that the systems are using don't even work. Systems get funding every year. Uh, Noel, you know this, right? For EBPs, and in the, in the data and the science is saying EBPs don't work, right? Safe We're looking at to work, but, when, but they don't. But evidence-based practices in the hands of people who understand the difficulties that our young people face are transformative. That's why 180 works. That's why community passageways works. That's why credible messengers works. That's why progress pushers works, right? When you're looking at this, right, what happens is we've, we've often got people in positions of power and systems that are responsible for the problem creating solutions. When I look at this, I don't see transformative. I see fancy words on paper, right? And I hate to say it, but the true public health approach starts with the public first, right? It's not partnering with the community. It's being informed by community. And then we go into, uh, let me scratch that. We start with racial equity. We figure out the specific segments of the community, right? Um, Judge Judy, you know I love you too, but at the end of the day, I'm also not into white fragility, so I'm going to push you. Dissent, right? People in systems, they fear dissent. Dissent is the, the tipping point of diversity. If we, if we don't... I think it's healthy. This is an example of what the fear of dissent, of dissent feels like. I digress. But the point that I'm making is this, right? If people in positions of power are responsible for creating the solution, but they contribute to the problem, how are we ever going to remove those pillars so this building comes crumbling down? We're not, and that's the shift. I think the true shift is equity. When you have people in positions in, in, in systems, oftentimes they're talking about programs. 
as opposed to policy shifts. When we look at the Constitution and we say it's a constitutional, we can change that, right? The Juvenile Justice Act was written in 1977. I was born in 1979. I can tell you a whole lot of shit that was made in 1977 that doesn't work, that we've gotten rid of. Does anybody in here have a microwave from 1977? What about a TV, right? Because that technology changes every year, right? To be respect, re receptive to the customer. But we still have a Juvenile Justice Act that's broken and we pretend like it's not. Specific points in the Juvenile Justice Act, League of Women Voters, you powerful women, right? We talk about the way the EBPs are allocated to community, but systems are using them in hiring positions so they get chargebacks. So they hire people to facilitate programs that might last four hours a week because they get to keep them 36 hours a week to do this other stuff. Why aren't those dollars going to community? Because in the Juvenile Justice Act, it says culturally relevant, right, and community-based. And, and, and the system is finding loopholes to be able to do that. One of the things that I really, really want to talk about, um, sorry, am I going to? You want me to stop? Okay. I just think at the end of the day, if we really want to create some sort of shift, we have to talk about policy shifts, right? If you look at successful communities um, where young people don't have the same issues as our lower income black and brown communities that were you know, put in these positions by the way that these policies have been shaped in the beginning, FHA, uh, the war on drugs, why don't we start thinking about sustainable solutions? Everybody's doing great programs, but who's teaching our young people business? Right? If you can run a gang, you can run a business. Right? I see the meme on, on Facebook all the time, and it, it's easy. If you can film a fight, you can create a documentary. Right? Right? If we're paying these evaluation firms hundreds of thousands, Zach, you gave us a grant for 75 grand for an evaluation firm, and we don't have an evaluation, right? That's not on Zach, it's on the firm. But why didn't we allocate $75,000 for young people to do participatory action research? Because they know what's working. That's putting dollars in the hands of the people who are marginalized in our communities. These shifts, we have to start thinking innovatively, and we have to invite people to the table that we don't traditionally have. And I apologize for saying it, but that's dissent. When I say something that doesn't hit the right way and you get defensive, right, you're, you're being resistant to my dissent. And my dissent might just be that piece of the solution. Um, I, I think the thing that is important to acknowledge when you look at the lineup here is that we are missing, deeply missing, the voice and the presence of women of color in this discussion. And I think it's important that if we're going to have a healthy and robust discussion, there needs, and I would encourage and advocate for there be another panel that is composed of, comprised of those uh, in our community um, who are doing amazing work, um, women who I highly respect, that we respect, and I think it's important to have their voices up here as well. So I don't want to take away from all the things that have been shared. I want to be able to acknowledge and push for us to go a little bit further because why is it that only primarily men ended up, except for judge, why is it just men up here? So you know, what's that about and how do we make sure um, that we keep this conversation going and that we're not excluding folks who um, play a, a huge part in this. Um, I think I had a question back here, if you all are okay with that, right? Two-part question, if I can. One, from each of your programs, could you tell us what your capacity for youth is and how many youth can you sustain in your program that come through your court system? And my second part of my question is, are you all partnering with the local businesses, the Safeways, the Albertsons, the QFCs that are calling 911 for a shoplift? Do they know to call you so that maybe before they get the police involved, they can process through some of your programs? That's a great question. Numbers, numbers, do you wanna give me some numbers, Sean? Uh, this year we'll serve a little over 500 youth and young adults, um, age 12 to 24. So over, a little over 500 youth and young adults, age 12 to 24. Um, in respect to the second question around partnering with local businesses, 
I, not our organization at this time. What I will say is there folks like Glover Empowerment Mentoring that have piloted a project that is beyond the pilot phase at this point inside of South Center Mall where they're doing exactly that and it's proven to be much more effective than arresting and incarcerating kids. Um, so it's, it's, it's definitely a point proven. Yeah. And I think it's being taken now to federal way to that mall there as well. Can you talk a little bit more about that project, like what it looks like? It's a great project, right? Instead of them permitting. It's, it's a really big project. project. Yeah. It's your project. <laughs> no, yeah. that's, I was like, Sean's on a, Sean's on a roll. Go for it, man. <laughs> Tell us more specifics about it. And maybe how it could be replicated in other business communities. Uh, yeah. Uh, so there is a pilot project, as Sean mentioned, that was developed by a number of organizations, including Glover and Power Mentoring, but then also Department of Public Defense for King County, uh, as well as Safe Futures Youth Center, uh, Tukwila Police Department, so on and so forth. And so it's based in the um, uh, Westfield South Center Mall, and it's called the Theft Free and Mall Safety Project, pilot project. And it's basically focused on how can we uh, when a child, when a, a youth 17 or under is picked up for what they call theft three shoplifting, uh, they basically are given the opportunity instead of having them be a, a rest, well they they are picked up by the police, but instead of them necessarily ending up in the courts, they give them an opportunity. So it's called a pre-filing diversion. Basically, instead of the prosecuting attorney's office filing on them and then ending up in the court, they give them the opportunity to go through a process of writing an apology letter getting services that they might have needed in the first place that might have in some way or another impacted or provoked the reason for why they might have got involved in shoplifting and then also um, provide them with this, potentially with this opportunity to even be employed by the same mall that they were picked up for shoplifting. So it's really just turning things around. Um, and as far as we know, there isn't another program in the US that really does something like that. I could be wrong. Because there's, uh, yeah, okay, so there may be some. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. So, but the point is, it's still dynamic, and it's a great opportunity to, and again, because we're trying to, particularly, um, you know, a number of us, we're, we're, I think a lot of us are trying to work towards this situation not even involving the system in the first place. And I, I'm not saying that to take away from the conversation about the detention. I'm saying that, that that's a big part of what we're trying to do is prevent there being contact in the first place. And so, um, does that, yeah. did you want me to sh okay. um, Yeah, I think that's great. And in fact, it happens on location at the mall, right? So it's yeah. very unique. They, they uh, the shop owners from the mall have like, there's an office at South Center where they just take the kids and talk to them about this alternative without them actually being processed it by police. Never goes to Right, so it doesn't actually get to the prosecutor's office, which is unique, but which it, it's a great idea, right, that something like that could be replicated in safe ways or other places. And it was driven by the fact that the defenders were seeing all these cases, and the prosecutors, all these shoplifting cases coming out of South Center that were just like these little shoplifting cases that was just cranking them through. How could we handle this different? And if there was a safe way or other areas where that is happening, it would be so great to see that working. So we were able to leverage that amount of police funds to pay for this pilot project, but the pilot project, as Sean pointed out, was something that was a brainchild out of the Juvenile Justice Equity Steering Committee where members of that Equity Steering Committee, which was um, started by Dow Constantine, so it was an opportunity um, to invest in dollars that, again, would be on the prevention side. And it sounds like it's happening someplace else that someone might be able to tell us about. Hi, I'm Nicholas. Um, yeah, in where I got my start with restorative justice was in Vermont, and they have a, a Nicholas Bradford with the National Center for Restorative Justice. Um, we do a lot of work in Seattle and Pierce County, across the state. And but my start was in Vermont. I'm from this area and kind of came back. But they do, and I would challenge you to to think about this as well. Is like police in Vermont are able to direct refer to community justice centers, right? So at no point does that paperwork go to the prosecutor. And, that it, and we would, we at the community justice center would get the paper, um, the ticket or citation or whatever, and the, the coordinator there would finish out a case, 
tear that up and that would never see the light of day. And I think that that's something that we need to be thinking about to like expand our options for, for that. Because I don't think it's in, like, if we're just waiting for malls or sort of like high concentrations of, of um, crime to happen to put in a, put in a, some sort of system, like that's not gonna, not gonna work. Um, but having police be able to do that. And I think that that's the other part of this is like, how are we, or you engaging with police um, to change their perceptions of young people, to change their, how they are engaging with young people, because currently we do have police. And I will say as a victim of crime, like that's an important part of like how I access the system was like calling the police, calling 911. And that's, that's just hard. As you know, as a believer, as a true believer in restorative justice, like I just, I wonder how you guys feel about that. Working, uh, somebody's been working on this a little bit. You mentioned this idea that a world where we wouldn't call 911 or where communities would have other alternatives. Are you, is there any movement on that issue? Well, well there's lead, but outside of. Yeah, I think that, so historically I've done work in partnering with folks in South King County law enforcement offices to work to defuse high levels of like gang activity. Um, but what I'll say is that there's def there, that the there's law enforcement officers and offices that are definitely primed to partner with community at this point, looking for the right community partner. Um, Co-laboring with system entities is really difficult, and it's super nuanced because you often have to share space with people who don't have the best interest of the folks that you love the most um, at the forefront of their minds, and sit across from them and wait patiently to get some place together, and that is a special skill set that many people simply just don't have the patience for. Um, and, and so I'll say that there's opportunity there, but there's also challenges with any opportunity that presents itself. Yeah. And just in yes. terms of working with the police, I, this is, I, that's an incredibly important point because there are these different junctures along the whole system where different people have their hands in it. And, and all I can say is that there are organizations that are statewide, that are local, that meet on a regular basis as a, an effort to bring together these various components from the community, from the prosecutor's office, defense, uh, treatment providers, the court, to, to deal with these issues. You know, it is a lot of talking, but I do think that it's a, a one more example of the motivation throughout King County and in Washington State to try to create these relationships to be more innovative and to come up with better solutions. And I absolutely agree that dissent and advocacy is a catalyst, it's an important catalyst. And, and we need all of those forces working at these really difficult problems. You know, we could decriminalize juvenile criminality. We could say it's not a criminal offense. But it's nothing that any one of us can do. It's a major policy overhaul. So I, that was a good question. I would quickly add that DYD, uh, we are Dear Youth Detention, youth detention uh, People working and to Justice uh, convene uh, a bunch of stakeholders across different sectors, which includes actually the uh, police chief um, and the police department, Seattle Police Department. And one of the things that we're looking at doing is having a conversation around how we can convene and take a regional approach and have a comprehensive plan. Um, because part of what happens is, is that we work in these different silos and we lack the ability to come together in ways that can break down um, these barriers because it's really complex. Like I just mentioned, like we know that a kid can, uh, a zip code can be a larger predictor more so than a kid's DNA, but we'll show up in a classroom, right, and tell a teacher, well, the problem is that you need to be more culturally, you need to be culturally responsive. Well, that might be true, and nine times out of ten, it is. However, it's a much more complex issue, and it requires all of us to be at the table, working together to figure out how we can look at these disparities that are in our different sectors. We know that these things are racially predictable, and now what can we do more intentionally to work together to cross-pollinate to begin to break down these barriers so we can better serve folks in the community? Are there other questions? My name is Shafiga Ramva. I'm a special education teacher. I teach high school um, specifically resource, so I work with a lot of kids with behavior. They qualify for services under behavior. And um, this might be a question for Zach, but so do you have any programs or do you focus 
on special education in terms of, so research has showed that kids with special education who qualify for services get higher, are suspended more and are expelled more and have a higher rate of entering the school to prison pipeline. So um, does anything, do you do any work surrounding that? And then um, a few years ago I had an experience where I had a student who ended up at, in a, at Echo Glen. And so as a teacher, I wasn't able to support in um, serving the IEP. So he wasn't getting services there. Um, so legally, his legal documents weren't being served to him. He wasn't getting services and parents didn't know how to navigate that. And so what are we doing to be able to support families in navigating this very confusing system? Excellent question. Zach, some of it was pointed at you, I think, with respect to that. Yeah, no, I appreciate you asking that question and it's not very often that people talk specifically about special education. Um, so. For folks who don't know, IEP means Individual Education Plan. And so um, there are a lot of protected rights around those who, when they receive that designation or um, a 504 plan, uh, there's certain accommodations and everything that uh, our students or our children who have those designations will receive in the school district. One of the things that's sort of dangerous about, and this is, this is not to detract from what you're talking about and what you want to highlight, uh, I, I used to work in the schools quite a bit as a child and family therapist, and one of the things that I noticed was that black and brown kids were disproportionately getting a lot of those designations. So basically saying there's something wrong with this kid and we need to put them in some sort of um, confinement, and, the, and it was in the schools. Now they weren't calling that, but then you walk into this special education class and it was full of black, black and brown children. What was that about? And and I think I think we have to check and ask some critical questions around what sort of decisions were being made and what sort of um, environment we were creating that, again, was contributing to this school to prison pipeline, right? So I, I just kind of mentioned that, but then in terms of programs that are specifically focused on that, not to my knowledge, but that being said, our programs that we invest in, so we ourselves are not, you know, Best Starts for Kids is not necessarily the ones doing the programming. We invest in these community-based organizations who are doing the programming, and a number of them serve a wide spectrum of youth and young adults, and some of them do have special education needs. So it's not so much that we have a program focused on special education, but we do have programs that serve youth and young adults and their families, and some of them are facing some of the challenges that come along with trying to get the needs met through an education system that was not designed for them to succeed. I want to be very clear about that. The education system set up is not broken. It's actually working very well. It just was never designed for certain ch children to succeed. And I know that's a, that's a bit of a kind of like offense to some of our educators, and, and that's that's not where I'm going with that. What I'm just saying is, is the very premise and the very setup of the education system, along with a lot of other systems we've been talking about, they're not broken. They're actually working really well. The thing is, is just like the Constitution, they never had certain people in mind to begin with. And so we have to, we have to talk about the backdrop when we're talking about these type of services. In, in Highline Public Schools, we began to um, co-labor with administration and teachers and the superintendent there to roll out a suspension and expulsion diversion program that has overlapped with the population of young people that you're working with. So young people who are at risk of being suspended or expelled, who have been suspended and need to get re-engaged faster or emergency expelled and need to be on ramp back to school, are participating in our five-week curriculum in lieu of those traditional um, criminalization practices. Um, and a large portion of that is connecting them with adults on campus that can be advocates for them that are also supporting them in this positive behavioral change. So when we're not working directly with the young person, there's advocates there that are able to be present to be champions for them too. Um, some of the really cool unintended consequences have been teachers re-envisioning the young people that they were previously working with and seeing them as the possibility that they are instead of the behavior that was once problematic and also young people who have gone through that are now serving as allies for other young people who are going through and being champions of their behavior change as they work to choose 180 as well. The, and then the irony about the special ed is that it's a civil rights act, right? I mean, the IDEA was actually a civil rights act to protect children with disabilities and the way that it's being used goes to Zach's point in terms of 
who was it written for, and it wasn't written for kids of color. Um, and that's really sad. It, um, but anyway, uh, we have a state representative here with us, too. So you have a question, and maybe you can also talk about some of the challenges of, let's say, changing all the policies so that she has crime is Thanks, Dr. Ambrose. Well, I'm going to not be a panelist, um, so I, I'm happy to answer questions, but I, I don't want to pontificate. Um, but I, I do want to own what we what we are responsible for at the state. Um, and I'm so sorry, I missed your name. Your name again. Shafiga. So, sorry, I'm Noelle Frame. I'm the state representative from the 36th district, which is northwest Seattle. Um, I'm the vice chair of the Human Services and Early Learning Committee, and I sit on the statewide partnership council for juvenile justice um, with Sean. And um, I want to own where we're responsible. And one of the things, the reason that child may not have gotten services at Echo Glen um, is because we have deeply underfunded not just public education in general, um, but even when we fixed public education funding with the McCleary lawsuit, we missed correctional ed. Um, and we took a run at it this last year, and we failed, and we're going to take another run at it um, because we, uh, kids who are currently uh, confined, have constitutional rights as well. And it's not just IDEA at the federal level. The state constitution guarantees them their right to public education. It's being denied to them. So I just want to own what, we, uh, what we're screwing up at the great state of Washington. Um, and then I guess for the panel, and I'm, I'm going to kind of throw a softball, but I'm interested and hearing it, I'm really interested in how we activate young people into advocacy. And Nick, you've done a good job of talking about how some of the young people you know, really did the sit-ins and demonstrated and that. But I want to see more people get into the awkward positions that Derek's in, where they're working inside the institution, and they're there with me, and they're helping to make decisions, and they're helping to write the policies. How can we get more young people activated to actually serve in public office and make their ranks up there? So I think. We have a duty to politicize our youth. Um, I would say specifically one of the ways that Credible Messengers does this is focusing on you know, that curriculum where we start with the relationship building and then we talk about what young people's goals are, guiding them through that process. Obviously using the motivational interviewing process, cognitive behavioral therapy in terms that speak to young people with tools that they're familiar with. But the politicizing our youth process, like how do we get young people invested in policy is a really interesting question. And I think we don't think of that enough because we're always focused on the program, right? The Band-Aid. So for us, the approach that we've used is actually starting to address policy. It starts with the day one of a 12 week uh, workshop where we specifically ask them in these questions, like what political issues are you being impacted by and your communities are being impacted by? And the reality is it's just an assessment. Sometimes young people are like, well, what do you mean political? Uh, nothing impacts me, right? And in that situation, it creates a, you know, this, this opportunity for dialogue around, you know, one young man was like, um, I just asked him, I said, you're a young man of color. I said, there's no issues that impact you. No. <laughs> Where are you from? I'm from Cambodia. I said, uh, immigration and deportation is not an issue for you. And he said, you know what? My dad is, and I didn't ask that issue being biased because my partner's Kamai. But I think at that point, it's like young people start to think about these issues. There were some young men in our group that, you know, who I know from relationships with other young people were having issues with the way that certain police in their community were treating them. But they didn't put any of those issues down. So when we started actually breaking it down to talk about the situations that they're posting on Facebook, they're like, well, police brutality is an issue in X, Y, and Z, right? Um, and I think when we start to get young people interested in policy, you start to see the lights come on. Today we had a conversation specifically around um, the war on drugs, right? And young people are like, the war on drugs? Like they really got laser focused on crack versus cocaine and I don't even know why you would smoke crack, you know? Like that's f***ed up, but it's, it's deeper than that, right? Like you gotta look deeper than that and I'll say like using those cognitive behavioral therapy tools right, those EBP tools in the hands of a credible messenger, they can actually get them to start processing. It's not even about using the drug, but those drugs being in your community, and this is how it started. So they start to see these interwoven connections within systems, government, um, county government, city government, how that trickles into their community, and then the impacts, right? We went from talking about the war on drugs to talking about generational poverty, and the reason why some people are actually using those drugs is almost a survival mechanism, right? To deal with the things that are happening. So now we have them thinking about FHA, redlining. These policies are impacting our community. 
this lack of generational wealth has impacted my parents, so they couldn't go to college. So getting them thinking about that, then we go, okay, how can we shift those policies on a local level, right? Here are some of the things that contribute to that. Here are some of the, 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 the results of those historical policies on communities of color that are currently impacting you. How do we start you know, undoing those policies? One of the things that you'll see um, in a program that Eddie Purpose, who is the ED of Progress Pushers, um, runs is you'll see through a policy grant with civil survival that we're actually gonna start talking about the policies that impact those young people and they will start writing op-eds around them in the way that they can actually create resources so we can build an awareness and say, hey, we gotta address these issues, right? From a youth perspective, this is how they impact us. But even going further, like working with partners who are interested in those issues, right? Um, I'll say Tara Simmons is a champion of this. Um, so through the Public Defenders Association, they've given Progress Pushers a grant to actually start this policy work, but taking it one step further to turn those young people into those policy advocates and analysts. So training credible messengers to push that training into the young people so they can start advocating and they can actually get a stipend to say, okay, now I'm gonna focus on what these shifts look like in our community and working with people like you know Noel Frame to be able to push that forward. Kim, I would add, um, prior to coming into this role, I would Dollars, start dollars from, uh, from Zach, uh, trauma-informed restorative practices, big red Zach down there at the end of the table. And uh, one of the things that we were able to do in the, in the process of that was take young people through a curriculum where they could then, at the end of that, identify an issue that was deeply impacting them in their school. And what I did was partner that with the school leadership team inside of that building, and they had learning improvement officers that then came out to share with them how a school is evaluated, how is your principal evaluated, and it started opening up the young people's eyes, right? And after they go through this process of them picking that issue, they then take what they learn and they provide that same training to younger students uh, at the local elementary school, right, or at the middle school. Um, and so I think it's really by engaging young people in ways that don't represent decoration and tokenism and the things that we like to do and then try and call it youth voice. And it's really creating an opportunity and a space where we can engage young people authentically because there is a level of creativity and ingenuity and an imagination that exists with young people that goes far beyond the capacity that we adults have who like to sit in meetings, to have the meeting, to talk about the meeting, for another meeting, and young people literally are so concise and so quick because part of it is, is that they're living this out, right? And they're experiencing these things, and so they quickly come up with solutions. So I believe young people have the ability to be architects of their own liberation if we're willing to provide the resources and the information and get out of the way. Wait, you guys could just talk and talk and talk forever. Um, it's about 835. I think these folks do want to get home. Um, so I am going to have to shut it down uh, and thank. So let's just, can we thank all of our panelists? And I just want to say, I think that we've given the League of Women Voters some things to think about. Like maybe next year the panel is going to be with young people up here, right? Yeah. And it'll be a youth forum where maybe we could have young women, you know, here. Uh, we could be the League of Young Women Voters and, uh, and get some real youth perspective. Pardon? And women of color would be great on the panel and as part of this process. So thank you so much for hosting us. Yes. So thank you. Thank you. Um, again, thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Um, panelists, you are amazing. Thank you all so much for donating your time to us this evening. I hope that this is the start of some really good momentum forward and partnerships for all of us. And I'm really, really excited to explore those further. Um, Audience, you've been lovely. Thank you so much. Um, next month, we will be having a forum here on climate change and what local governments are doing, specifically in King County, to address climate change. So if you kind of liked what we did here tonight, I encourage you to come check us out next month. Um, and until then, have a great evening. <laughs>